Welcome to Capital Link's company presentation series. Welcome to Capital Link's corporate presentation webinar series. In this series, senior management of listed shipping companies provide an update on their operations, business development, strategy, and sector outlook. I am Nicolas Bornois, president of Capital Link. Capital Link is an investor relations firm also active in event and conference organization. We work with several private and publicly listed companies, including companies featured in this webinar series. As noted in our disclaimer, these presentations are purely for informational and educational purposes. They do not constitute investment advice or advice of any kind, and uh, evidently Capital Link bears no responsibility for them. Today, we're delighted to have with us the senior management of uh, Navigator uh, Gas. We have Mr. Neil Nolan, the uh, chief financial officer, and Mr. Oivin Lindemann, the uh, chief commercial officer. Uh, the whole session will last 45 minutes. We will start with a brief uh, uh, slide presentation uh, that will be followed by live Q&A. Uh, please, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you have the Q&A button and uh, you are welcome to submit your questions anytime. And these questions will be uh, answered by the panelists uh, after the slide presentation. Or you can email the questions to us at questions at capitalink.com. I'm sorry, webinars at capitalink.com. Thank you for joining us. I'm turning the floor over to Neil and uh, Oyvind. Well, thank you to Capital Link to hosting us and allowing us to, to inform the audience about uh, Navigating Gas, to, a snapshot of where we are and where we're going and where we're heading to. So uh, we've been asked to talk a little bit about the background of Navigator and and the future. So I will just uh, we prepared a, a short presentation, and the aim is to be 20 25 minutes with that, and then uh, focus more on the Q and A. So just bear with me. Um, so navigating gas. Uh, there's a forward-looking statement on page two. I believe this slide pack will be distributed afterwards by Capital Link. But uh, anyhow, the uh, important bit is uh, Navigate Gas, the company we are, and where are we, where we come from, where we're we at, and where we're we going. So this is just a, a slight uh, historic slide that you can read later. Essentially, it shows of uh, meager beginnings back in 2000 with five vessels. So during 2006 to 2012, we embarked on uh, consolidating the handy size gas carrier uh, market the segment and then from 2013 to 2018 organic growth coming up to 38 vessels and then in 2018 19 we uh, added on a joint venture with energy uh, enterprise product partners for an ethylene export terminal the world largest in the u.s gulf so we at that point we had 38 ships and uh, a very nice ethylene export terminal and then last year, we successfully uh, embarked on a merger with Ultragas, uh, adding 18 vessels to the fleet. And now uh, <clears throat> that fleet is the market leading in the handy size segment with 35% market share, which is very special. With the five, 54 ships in total, different assets and types and capabilities and the ethylene export terminal. So we'll go a little bit uh, basic now in terms of what we carry, what the ship types are capable of doing, and then uh, what, what we're doing with those assets to create value. We participate in essentially three, four markets because of the asset types that we do own and operate. One is LPG, which is a low carbon fuel uh, or feedstock, it's regional trade for Navigator. 43% uh, of our earnings days is from LPG. So it's still important. It used to be much larger. We'll get into that of the trends we're seeing and our participation in those trends. Petrochemicals is all things, uh, household essentials, anything from isolation to um, medical equipment, 
to, to iPads and cars and so forth, petrochemicals is a gas that goes into those products. And the driver for that is GDP demand. Ammonia is a third leg that we stand on, which is relating to crop fertilizer production and crop growth. So the driver is, is generally uh, world population and the demand for food. So that's pretty sustainable. Then lately we've been, uh, we have seven vessels doing ethane. Ethane is very interesting molecule from the US, very cheap, and it's the most efficient gas for the production of ethylene. And we're gonna talk about a little bit as well about CO2. CO2 is a, um, potentially a fifth leg for navigator in terms of uh, a gas that can be transported. Still in its infancy, we have a joint venture and that focuses solely on carbon capture and transportation of CO2. But going back to basic again, so what makes Navigator special is the assets we have. Uh, there are three different gas carrier types, fully refrigerated, semi-refrigerated and pressurized vessels is a mouthful. Essentially, depending on the equipment you have, the assets you have, and the containment system you have. It uh, allows you or restricts you in what you can carry. So on the far right, on the pressurized side, they can only carry warm LPGs. On the far left, which generally are the larger gas carriers, they can only carry cold product, cold LPG, fully refrigerated. But then in the middle, uh, where Navigator is positioned, is our ships can do cold, we can do warm product, and we can do petrochemicals down to minus 104, which is ethylene. We can do ammonia, we can do propylene, we can do all the products in the gas spectrum at any temperature, which is the uniqueness of Navigator. And that's our core. And that is why we can put, uh, can uh, carry and participate in LPGs, petrochemicals, and ammonia markets, not only one. And where do we sit in the world of gas carrier? The gas carrier industry consists of about 1,300 ships, something like this. We are in the middle. So in the handy size space, there's about 118 vessels. That is where we operate. That is where we have 35% market share. It has a low order book, which is great. We also have some ships uh, in the segment just below. Also low order book. And we have a, couple, a few ships in the one above in the medium size, however, being ethane capable. So that is the space we uh, operate in, in the middle. And then you have some larger ships above and some very small ones at the bottom. But that's just to give you a perspective of where Navigator sits in the gas carrier industry. And to, you know, picture tells, you know, a thousand words, but just to capture everything I've been talking about up to this point is this picture. So this is in the US Gulf. Uh, and it's quite unique because we have three Navigator vessels and there's one VLGC fully refrigerated LPG only ship. They can only do LPG, but what we are doing in this picture, while you can't see the gas because it's liquid, <laughs> frankly, you shouldn't be seeing gas. Uh, we do at this particular moment in time, we carry propane on one ship. We're loading propane. Another ship is discharging butadiene, which is a petrochemical cargo in the same place. And another ship is loading ethylene. So this picture captures our positioning and the markets we participate in being LPG and petrochemicals with specialized ethylene capable vessels able to carry products minus 104 temperature, which I think is 155 minus Fahrenheit. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> so just uh, those were the basics, just to capture Navigator in a snapshot of our positioning, the assets, 
Um, we issued a training update last night, so you might have seen that. But anyways, um, <clears throat> what we wanted to say with that was that Q4 went very well, probably the best quarter we had for a long time. Uh, but anyways, it was helped by the Ultragas merger in terms of additional ships, additional equipment assets to trade. Our utilization for the quarter was 91.4%, which is very high, which is very good compared to third quarter. Uh, January, not January, December had 95%, believe it or not. The joint venture Italy in ter export terminal had a record month in the fourth quarter of 234 thousand tons. January has exceeded that as a standalone month with more than 100,000 tons of exports, which is 20% above nameplate capacity. So that asset was really performing uh, during fourth quarter and particularly in January. The freight rate environment has improved during fourth quarter. We'll touch upon about that a bit later. And now we talk about the, the, our capital allocation and reduced debt and debt profile, and that is reducing, which is a great thing. So just to recap, uh, Navigator, 35% market share in our core segment, Handy Size, which is quite unique for any shipping company to have that market share in any given segment. Um, we are diversified within that, so we have some fully refrigerated ships, less flexible, but most of them, the core is ethylene capable and semi-refrigerated capable, which then means that we can show to the pie chart to the right, whereby we do ammonia, we do LPG, and we do petrochemical gases. And other shipping companies in our space tend to be only talking about LPG, but we talk about those three and that benefits Navigator and, and our journey forward. When we talk about rates, I mentioned that the rates during fourth quarter improved, which you can see on this graph on the left-hand side. It shows uh, historics back to 2014. The graph uh, is quoted by Clarkson's, an independent shipping company. They quote every week, and we capture these, these data points in this graph. They quote every week, what do they think the market should be for a 12 month charter at that point in time? And because Navigate, we have different vessels, albeit same size, but they have different capabilities. So the rate environment for those specific ship types are different. So Clarkson's have recognized that. And the uh, start of this year, they started quoting a rate assessment for handy size 21,000 cubic ethylene ship. This is new for this year. And you can see where that is on the graph, which are quoting now at $875,000 a month. Then you have the handy size semi-refrigerated, which if you've been following Navigator, you've been using quite often. That's at $690,000 a month. Then the handy size fully refrigerated, which is $620,000 a month. And then with the ultra gas merger, 10 vessels are 12,000 cubic to 8,000 cubic. And you can see the rate assessment there at 525. So the basket for us for Navigator is a mixture of these four rates but you can see the more the, the vessels with the most capacity or capability are the handy size ethylene and they are quoted the highest which you should be and then further down what uh, uh, makes me sleep at night is the are the graphs to the right so not only is the rate environment increasing but the future has grown and it has growth in all the three markets we participate in. So the assets allow us to participate in these three markets. LPG is increasing, growth is there, US production is up. If you go to the EIA website, they have 
put up their forecast, for instance, for LPG production. LPG production in the US is hugely important. L uh, demand in the US is flat. So any new production goes to export markets. And you can see the trend going upwards. Similarly for petrochemicals, which is very important to us with the terminal and the demand for petrochemical products still up over the next few years, similarly with ammonia. So that gives us comfort for the next, for the supply side, more products to ship for the fleet or for the industry going forward. If you look at navigators specifically of our performance, we talked about a quite healthy utilization for the fourth quarter of 91.4%. You can see it in the graph to the left. More ammonia earning stays for Navigator, that's increasing. It's a trend that will continue and we are participating in that. More petrochemical earning stays, uh, partly through our terminal, partly through backholes, propylene and so forth, pushing the middle LPG up. And that creates the cushion for the higher utilization. And the outlook for first quarter 2022, we expect that to be above 90%, albeit it's a dip in February, which is a normal thing due to Olympics and Lunar New Year, but we still expect that to be robust. Another trend that we are seeing is the importance of North America. So to the, on the graph on the right-hand side, you can see the volume that we have exported from North America over the last couple of years. And it's gone from 15% to almost one third to 40% of Navigator's volume. So the age old saying, if, uh, if America sneezes, the world catches a cold is true for our handy sized business. It is very important both on, on feedstock exports of ethane and the exports of derivative products like ethylene from the US. Why? Because the feedstocks in the US so cheap, attractive to international markets. So they are produced there and we export that. And this, why the North America is so important to us, we, we take that into account. So going forward, we are going to open an office in Houston to, to be closer to, to where all the action is in terms of the future of navigation. On ethylene specifics, on the left-hand side, you can see the ethylene exports from the US. And you can see January, the, the dark blue line there is from our joint venture export terminal, which is a record month. And that is very nice to see. That is performing better than we thought, 20% above nameplate in that month. It's not gonna be every month, but they've proven that they can. And those cargoes are shipped on ethylene ships, which we also, have, we have a large market share in. On the graph to the right, you can see the arbitrage from US ethylene to the world. At the moment, the arbitrage to Asia is shut. The light blue is Asia, the dark blue is US, the line. But Europe is wide open. So the ethylene today is going to Europe. We believe after the lunar year, after Olympics in China, that the light blue will go up. Uh, all expectation is that the dark blue line, which is the US price, will go down uh, <clears throat> once they come over some, uh, uh, some of the production is, has restarted and the base star cracker is up, so that will come off, making uh, vessels go to Asia again. But why is the, is the arbitrage going to be open in Europe for some time? We believe so. In a high oil environment with a crude barrel above $90 a ton, European production is so uncompetitive to US production of ethylene or ethane, that will continue to flow to Europe should also continue to flow to Asia because most of the crackers, they have NAFTA, which is based on oil. You can't, you know, US production has a huge advantage 
to be price competitive to international markets. So that will continue. So closing remarks from me is this map. I love a map. Uh, I put the North America in the central here. Uh, in European school books, it's, it's not, but uh, thinking of the audience, it is. And also for Navigator, because it, most of our volume and earnings, they stem from America. And that is from the East Coast. It is from the US Gulf and also on the West Coast in Canada. And you can see the trade lanes that we have done Navigator only in 2021. And you can see the, pipe, the extension of the pipeline service from the midstream companies to international markets connecting the continent. So we bring the consumers with the producers in the US and we link them up with our shipping service. Uh, connecting also our terminal to those customers abroad. And you can see that why is America good for us? Because it's far away from consuming markets. So you can see the petrochemical volume versus earnings days are widely different than the volume and earnings days in ammonia or LPG. It means that one ton takes longer to trade, to, to save, takes up capacity. So that is important to navigate. And that is why petrochemicals and the future of petrochemicals is important. And we believe that infrastructure in the US is part of our future, is part of our game plan, connecting the fleet, connecting the customers. And petrochemicals should be produced in the US because of the cheap feedstock and the advantage they have and the world will import. And that's kind of the, this map captures all, all that, what we're trying to achieve. With that, I put to Nile here. You're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, and thank you, and good day to everybody. Um, so just very briefly on, on some of the financial points here, Navigator, as, as I've mentioned right on the, on the first slide, is a relatively young company, just less than 20 years of age. Um, and this balance sheet is, is pretty straightforward. The assets comprise of cash, the vessels, the terminal, the liabilities are loans, and then we've got, we've got the equity. The cash at the end of September was 105 million, and you can see the bar on the right has risen to 124 million at the end of December and something we mentioned last night. The vessels are at $1.9 billion. And, and typically, albeit that that is a book value, the vessel appraised value from brokers is something akin to that. At June uh, 30th, it was just slightly uh, uh, less than $100 million uh, greater than the broker assessed values. The terminal is in at 143 million. It, we paid 148 million to for our 50% share. That has a valuation of somewhere between 250 and 275 million. So actually, its book value is similar to the over, overstated book value of the vessel. So net net, I think we're about about equal. And the debt, having assumed five bank loans from the ultra gas merger, is running at about a billion dollars at the end of September. And again, we announced last night that we paid off something like $24 million in Q4. That gives an equity of $1.2 billion. And against the 77 million, 77 million shares in issue gives a, a book value or a kind of an appraised value of $15 per share. And on, on the right, as I mentioned, the, the bar charts show the cash. We've got $23 million of undrawn facilities. We've got a requirement to have $50 million under various of our, our bank loans, giving us a $97 million headroom. We also announced that we sold Navigator Neptune for $21 million. That cash has come in since December 31st but will be or is mandated to be offered to the bondholders. And I'll come back to that in a moment um, as part under which the vessel acted as security. 
On the next slide, we just outline the uh, various debt piles and those uh, where we have fixed LIBOR. LIBOR is obviously on the increase at the moment. Um, the current three month US LIBOR is about 0.3%. And all of the blue bars, which represent individual loans, have fixed rates attached to them. And those are the fixed rates. In addition, there is a bank margin um, for each of those facilities, which range between two and two and a half percent. So generally, the cost of debt is around four uh, percent for our bank loans. And you'll see in the 2025 column, there is one of the unsecured bonds at eight percent and one of the, the red column, one of the red bars in 2023 is the uh, other Norwegian bond that we have at six percent. The red the red columns represent those that are not, that are on floating LIBOR rates, but as you can see, they are all biased towards early redemptions in uh, both this year and next year. The next slide shows the quarterly repayment profiles that we have, and, and you'll see for 2022, it totals just under $100 million, uh, 27 million, which is the heritage ultra gas loans and 75 ish million is the heritage navigator loans. So that equates to about $25 million for, per quarter for 2022. And it reduces as the loans mature throughout that piece. And as I mentioned, we paid 24 million of uh, debt repayments in Q4. The following slide then shows the profile of the maturities for those various debts. Uh, the first one we have in 2022, there, it's, there are three tranches that expire in 2022, and the similar colored bar in 2023 relates to the same facility. There are five ships in total, and the $50 million in 2022 uh, expire at various stages, first in April, and then it's August and October. We, those are relatively new ships, or the security on those are relate to relatively new ships. They are six years of age. So we will refinance that batch in uh, the summer of this year. The $72 million at the top of the stack in 2023 relates to the Norwegian bond. That, as I say, will be the subject of a tender offer for $21 million of it, i.e. the proceeds from Navigator Neptune. And if accepted by the bondholders, we'll obviously reduce that bond to $50 million. And it, it matures in November 2023, but it is likely that we will pay it off in, in reducing our debt, uh, probably towards the back end of this year. And then there are two other facilities coming up for maturity in 2023, which we will refinance at probably similar levels to the outstandings. Um, on the bottom right hand section of that of that graph, we've got just the loan to values. And again, we show the total assets, including the terminal of just over $2 billion, against which we have a uh, billion dollars of debt that I, I just referred to. If you take, which gives you a 40, less than 50% uh, loan to value or a 46% uh, debt to capitalization. If you take the hundred million dollars that I mentioned for quarterly debt repayments in 2022, along with a reduction of the $72 million for the bond that I mentioned that we would probably repay at the end of 2022, you get to a, a revised debt number of $827 million. And that equates to just under 40% to uh, debt to capitalization. And that, that is probably um, our, our target as to where we will go. In terms of performance, uh, this is a slide that we produced for Q3 um, and Q3 2021 relative to the previous quarters, you can see the increase in operating revenue. That's principally as a result of the additional ships that we took on from Ultragas and the revenue that that generated, that transaction was, um, occurred on August the 4th. So it was there for part of, of uh, Q3 and our EBITDA increased to $40 million during that quarter. 
That net income, which we generated during Q3 of $6.7 million, was made up of the vessel income of $21 million, the terminal contribution of 3.3, and then we had GNA costs, interest, and uh, some sort of forex. If you look at how we increase that 6.7 million for Q4, as we suggested, it is going to be significantly better than, than Q3. The real benefits will come through the vessel income. Uh, the terminal will nudge up the terminal net income of $3.3 million. There is about $1.6 million of depreciation in there, which gives you just under $5 million of EBITDA, um, which is about a $20 million of EBITDA for on an annual basis. We would expect that to nudge up closer to $25 million for 2022. The GNA costs are simply an amalgam of the ultra gas GNA costs to the navigator GNA costs. Again, once synergies kick in um, and the integration takes into account, we would expect that number to reduce. Our target would be something like $1,000 per vessel per day which equates to about $20 million per year or $5 million per quarter. Now that's not gonna happen instantly. There is a process ongoing to integrate systems, integrate roles and so on, which uh, that would be the target for more like 2023, but you should see a trajectory in, in that direction throughout 2022. Interest, as I showed on the previous slide is pretty much fixed. So it's not going to change that much. So all of the increase, and as Ivan mentioned, will come from uh, the vessel, rev re vessel uh, income, which in turn is vessel revenue, which is both volume because of utilization increasing and the rate environment that that entails. Um, and then finally, on, on this slide, this again is a repeat of the performance of uh, Q3, showing that $6.7 million of net income and on the box on the right, again, it is uh, the statistics from Q3, and you will see that it's 84% utilization, where it's 91% for Q4, which gives a, a significant increase in the rates. And that, that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. So we're pretty in a pretty good place. Uh... Uh, we've had the best run since we have for many years, and I uh, hope that will continue. <clears throat> the fundamentals are there on the Etelian side. The terminal is performing, exporting as uh, expected. The rate environment is better. Utilization is up. And that is because we are doing more L uh, petrochemicals and ammonia, a little bit less LPG, but that's okay as long as we the petrochemical is increasing and ammonia is increasing. North America is hugely important to us, and that will continue to be so. Uh, whilst we are operating the ships, uh, we are looking at ways to to connect infrastructure by creating demand for our core business, the ships, and uh, that is pretty exciting. I think we have a couple of questions here, Niall. So there's a, there's, a, there's a number of questions, and, and apologies if we sort of um, miss miss some of them. But the uh, the, la the last question that's in, uh, just because it's the last question is in, relates to the ship sales, both the Navigator Neptune and the Happy Bride, and whether they were sold at a at a gain or a loss. The um, Navigator Neptune will be sold at a loss as its book value is a, is a, um, a hereditary book value. And I, I referred to the fact that the, the aggregate of the book values is about $100 million, slightly less than $100 million greater than the broker assessed value. So that one will be a $6 million loss. The happy bride will be sold at uh, the book value or was sold at the book value. So there is neither a profit or a loss. That's not surprising given the accounting treatment that when we've just bought it in or effectively bought it in August, then we would take it in at um, the appraised value and, and therefore you wouldn't expect it to be either a profit or a loss. I think in the wider question we have reviewed, and I mentioned this on the Q3 earnings call, we have reviewed reviewed the estimated, estimated economic life of our vessels, which Navigator has historically depreciated their vessels to 
um, recycled or scrap value over 30 years, we think that is probably no longer appropriate in uh, this world of environmental and, and ecological uh, advancement that has been made principally over the last two years, but has been uh, on the agenda for some time. And we have decided that 25 years is, mo is a more appropriate uh, period over which to um, depreciate our vessels. That will then lead to an impairment of those vessels, particularly the, the likes of Navigator Neptune and its sister vessels, of which there are five, at the year end. So there will be a, an impairment right off at the year end. And, and that will probably be something in the region of about $50 million. There's a question about ammonia's fuel uh, and the future of that. Generally, a gas is being viewed and we participate uh, in pushing the the boundaries for gas as fuel, because gas is a stepping stone to from oil. Gas is a stepping stone into something less greenhouse gas em emitting fuels. So we are heavily involved in discussions on that. We have worked uh, uh, long and hard with uh, DNVGL to have an approval in principle for the construction and design of a ship that can use ammonia as fuel. Uh, I think that this green, if you look at the graph to the left, I think ammonia will be a bigger part for Navigator going forward. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of discussions which we participate in, in terms of uh, construction of ammonia plants, but uh, the transportation of either blue or green ammonia, and green ammonia can be converted to hydrogen once it reaches its uh, destination. Uh, shipping hydrogen is hugely complex, but uh, transporting ammonia is way easier and i think that that is uh, we're still seeing baby steps at the moment but i think i think it's it's a future and we're participating in that not going to happen tomorrow but definitely during this decade there's a question on ultra gas and the merger and the effects the strategic perspective and the effects of or the results going forward from from that merger uh, to benefit shareholders, and I and I touched on that in terms of the GNA costs as to where it goes. But the more significant reduction in costs will come from the vessel OPEX, which is obviously a greater number. It's over a hundred million dollars across the across the fleet in any given year. Um, there are things that we each do that will be of benefit to the combined entity. There are significant synergies in, in that um, arena. The one obvious one would be that Ultra Gas have the um, in-house crewing facility, which Navigator have outsourced. So were we to take in our crewing in-house for the Navigator vessels, then that would be a significant saving in the uh, millions, if not tens of millions. Now, again, that's not something that you can flick a switch and it'll be done overnight because to take crewing from third party managers into in-house managers, there are all sorts of metrics and it's a, it's a process rather than, a, than an immediate effect. So again, that's something that we would be targeting um, to have a significant impact in 2023. But again, throughout 2022, you should see as we report our OPEX um, per vessel, our daily OPEX running costs, you should see that trending downwards in uh, 2022 as that, as that process takes effect. Um, there's a question about how important uh, is the uh, ethylene joint venture for Navigator and can it bring uh, more projects like this? So the obvious, the ethylene terminal and the joint venture and the connection by creating demand for the core fleet is obviously hugely important. It's contracted uh, almost 100% is performing now and bringing pipeline uh, product to the fleet, but also revenue itself as a standalone entity. But the, the, the future then is, the obvious one is to, to expand, to be able to expand, add capacity to that terminal for half the capex, but uh, get another million tons. And that is something that we're working together with enterprise 
the last year, ethylene pricing in US was very vol volatile. If you remember the deep freeze caused havoc across the supply chains. So no, no, no customers, new customers were hesitant to commit to long-term. I think with time, they will come to, to the table again. But uh, it puts Navigator in, in, uh, in a position whereby people think of us as not only a shipping company, but a logistics company, meaning that the, the juncture between infrastructure and shipping is there. And if you, die, if you do business, you do more business. And if you have one the infrastructure, you should be able to pull up something more. So this is something we're working hard on, but not forgetting the core, which is the shipping part, doing specialized products on specialized assets and keeping, you know, defending our market share uh, and so forth. There's a question then about, I, I, I referred to $170 million of debt reduction or likely debt reduction in 2022. What would we do with the surplus cash flow thereafter? Um, if, if, there is a, if there is a surplus cash flow, which we're certainly modeling that there is, um, and uh, as long as our forecasts are right, then um, I think the immediate priority would be to reduce our debt somewhat, particularly on the terminal side. And I referred to that, that bond that was covered by the, or was taken out to facilitate the uh, construction of the terminal. Um, the 170 million in total, if, if we've got cash, surplus to that and there are no investment opportunities then certainly the board would consider um, a dividend or return to shareholders in some form i don't think we're quite there yet and the board has not fully considered that bearing in mind the board is is relatively new less than six months post the um, merger with ultra gas um, but but clearly that that is something that would be considered and there's a question about the impact of the larger ships. So th this is the environment we live in on the tonnage supply side. And fortunately, the, uh, the handy size and below, very low order book, as you can see on this page. However, on the larger ships, there's a fair amount coming in over the next two to three years. They're not coming in one go, which is good, so that causes uh, the question. And I think about that a lot and how can we position ourselves to mitigate a large order book from the larger ship. Now, keep in mind that they can only do fully refrigerated LPG. So they have less, they are restricted in cannibalizing or competing on the petrochemical space. So that is one to bear in mind. But LPG, there is LPG growth, forecasted LPG growth, production of LPG, particularly in the US, and hence the exports. So you have a little bit, you have more LPG supply than needs to be transported. So that you have regulatory uh, requirements coming in to reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions in the shipping space. So from 2023 onwards, there's something called EEXI and CII regulation. So the older parts of the fleet, both large and small throughout the whole segment, some ships will have to slow down, which causes inefficiencies and inefficiencies in shippings are always good. And you have Panama Canal issues. So today, the largest ships here at the top the very large gas carriers. Average wait time through Panama is uh, all ranging from a week to two weeks, 14 days to go through. Why? Because they need to go through the new locks and the bigger ships, LNG, container ships, af can afford to pay up in the slot auction to get there. So that increases in efficiencies waiting, but also some of these ships are going longer via Cape and so forth. So there are mitigating factors to the bigger ships and the order book, but it's one to watch clearly. There is a question about, and, and perhaps it's, Ivan, you can jump in if, if, if I'm saying everything wrong, but uh, what is the outlook for the smaller ships uh, in the new combined fleet? I, I think it's probably worth pointing out 
that other than the handy size ships and larger, which navigate the total 45 vessels, the other ships that we acquired as part of Ultragas are managed independently by the Unigas pool. Now, the Unigas pool has been around since 1969, so it's 52 years. Um, there are two other participants as well as Navigator in that pool, and they have a total of 34 vessels of that size, so sub 15,000 cubic meter uh, vessels. The, there is a, about let, just slightly less than 50% of those are 12,000 cubic meter ethylene ships. And I even mentioned before that ethylene is being moved at the moment because of arbitrage reasons to Europe, and those vessels are specifically beneficial in carrying some of that cargo to some ports within Europe. It's a shorter distance than, than the Far East, and we've certainly seen an uptick and expect to continue to see an uptick in those uh, smaller ships. So I think that's four to five minutes. I think we're one minute over, but <clears throat> we are certainly writing the future and we when we present this timeline on our website and so forth from 2022 onwards we we then working hard on adding some major milestones to that now the underlying business is doing much better than it's been doing in the past which is great but we're working hard on adding some things here all ranging from co2 through our joint venture called dan unity through potentially more infrastructure, uh, consolidation, uh, ammonia, ammonia's fuel. So there's a, a bunch of things to be excited about in the navigator space. And we have an excellent platform to, uh, to spring and attack some of those things. And that's really my, my conclusion. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking us through uh, a very interesting presentation and through an avalanche of questions. Uh, I think uh, this is indicative of the, of the interest uh, in the following that we have. So uh, I would like to thank you very much for uh, joining this uh, uh, presentation series. And uh, just to remind uh, everyone that this presentation will also be archived and available upon demand for those who would like to access it later. Again, Niall and uh, Oivin, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Nicholas, for, for hosting us and thank you all for joining our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.